the April 7th through 8th Guardian Long Range Team Match at Frontline Defense, this week on Mail Call Mondays. Mail Call Mondays is brought to you by Modular Driven Technologies. If you need a chassis system for your precision rifle, check out mdttac.com. I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and we're here with Sarah. And uh, we're going to talk about the Guardian Long Range match at Frontline Defense that we both competed in in April 7th through 8th, which would be this last weekend. And uh, we, I say we competed in it, <laughs> really, Sarah competed in it. I made it through a stage and a half before I had to withdraw with equipment issues. Uh, but thankfully, she shot the whole match, and then she shot the team match on the second day. Uh, so she's going to be able to fill in anywhere that uh, that I kind of messed up. Uh, so the plan here is we'll go through, I'll read the stage briefs, and then uh, Sarah will kind of give her opinion on how things went and uh, how she liked the obstacles and whatnot. So you want to say anything before we get started? Um, first and foremost, the weather was horrible. Um, <laughs> it rained. I don't even know if it ever stopped raining. Um, it, it dropped. The temperature got cold. Um, so it wasn't the best shooting conditions. We actually had a few people that this was their first actual match, and we felt horrible for them because not only were you dealing with the elements on top of something new, it just all around was just not a good, I don't want to say a good time. It was a good time, but it could have been better if Mother Nature had cooperated. So with that, knowing that my husband's rifle wasn't the only one that went down, a lot of equipment issues happened over the weekend. And that's that's to be expected anytime you have rain and mud uh, just even not taking into account the human factor and how it affects uh, shooters' mindset. Um, when you have match rifles that are that have uh, all the tolerances taken out of them, and guys are running hot loads and uh, these really lightweight match triggers, uh, then it doesn't take a whole lot of environmental effects before it causes these guns to go down. I talk about all the time the difference between a competition rifle and a military or law enforcement rifle. A military or law enforcement rifle has to function no matter what the conditions. So sometimes uh, you will have to sacrifice that super light trigger pull or that uh, super fire formed load uh, for something that functions 100% of the time with no problems whatsoever. And uh, I make absolutely uh, no excuses. My my 6.5 Ma 10 is a competition rifle uh, that was never built up to be a military rifle. Uh, but We'll talk about the issues I have with it a little bit on, later on. And if you missed last week's Mail Call Mondays, uh, I broke it down fairly clearly and uh, actually showed some pictures of what went wrong with that rifle. Uh, so if you want to know what went wrong with my rifle, make sure you go back and check out last week's Mail Call Mondays. Uh, so to start off, uh, we showed up. Uh, one thing about uh, this weekend's Guardian match is that there was no ability to zero the rifle starting on Saturday. Um, you did have a chance to zero Friday during uh, Friday evening check-in, uh, but there was no chance to zero on Saturday, and that will mm -hmm. that'll come in here in a few minutes into what we had going on. Uh, we both had to work uh, leading up to the Guardian, and then we drove out, so... Uh, Thursday was my last day to get everything together, and uh, I actually ended up doing a thrash day where I loaded 140 rounds of ammunition for both of us, and then I had to take both guns out, and it was actually uh, after dark uh, when I took both guns out and chronographed and then zeroed them, and Sarah was actually still at work on Thursday while I was out zeroing her rifle. Uh, so just to let you guys know, there are situations where different shooters will have different zeros on the rifle. That's even if you dial the parallax out, everything else, um, our eyes are slightly different. Our facial structure is slightly different, and that can place you in a slightly different place uh, behind the optic uh, when you're shooting it. So it's really important, if at all possible, to make sure that the person that will actually be shooting the gun is the person that zeroes the gun. Uh, you can get it close, but they need to do the fine tune. Uh, so we were starting on Friday, or uh, we drove out Friday, and that took all day. It's an 11-hour drive from here. Uh, so Saturday, we were starting fresh and early. Uh, thankfully, the rain broke just long enough for us to get the initial brief and get our gear out of the vehicles. 
and uh, get our wet weather gear on because we would pretty much wear wet weather gear for the entire first day. Uh, we pulled the rifles out, but again, didn't have any chance to check zero. And unfortunately, we didn't have any cold bore stages. I almost always like when they have the AccuShot cold bore stage. Uh, B&T Industries usually sponsors a stage for the Guardian uh, where you are shooting on a playing card. And whoever gets closest to the center crosshairs on the card uh, gets a certificate for an Atlas bipod. Uh, so... Usually that is the first stage on one of the days. If it is the first stage on day one, uh, then it is an excellent chance to check your zero because only one shot on the card gets scored. If there's multiple shots on the card, uh, then they are not scored. But that prone, precise 100-yard stage allows you to check the zero on your gun, and then you may lose a point on that stage or may lose that stage, uh, but you're good to go on the rest of them. So that actually ended up being the first stage on day two, so it didn't help us in this instance. Uh, our first stage, of course, was the longest range stage <laughs> of the whole day. Uh, so our squad started out on stage nine, and stage nine was titled Thanks, Paul. And uh, it had five targets, uh, 800, 850, 900, 950, and 1,000. Uh, the trick is, though, the way the targets were arrayed across the stage, if you were shooting left to right, which is what the stage required, then you were shooting a 900-yard target, a 950-yard target, a 1,000-yard target, 850, and 800-yard target. Mm -hmm. uh, so you didn't get just to dial up. You had to dial up and then dial back, and you had to make sure you kept track of your mm -hmm. dope. So something like Sarah has on the side of her rifle here, uh, to be able to keep track of your dope is very useful. Now, this was a prone stage uh, shot from an elevated deck with a roof over top of it. Mm -hmm. So we did get a little bit of uh, uh, rest from the rain, and we were able to get our gear squared away and get our rifles up without being poured on. And uh, because it was prone on the deck, you could just have a data card laying next to you, or you could have your data book laid out next to you and uh, it wouldn't get rained on. You could use your data from there. Uh, the, uh, the stage overall was fairly simple. Uh, each one of these targets uh, was a fairly meaty target. They were uh, full-size, IPSC, or better targets. Uh, so really, it wasn't that difficult of a stage. And again, you're prone. Uh, what made it difficult is, of course, the rain, uh, its effects on the weapon, and of course, the uh, any wind or any environmental effects that you had downrange. Now, when I got up there to shoot, uh, you could see downrange the mist. Mm -hmm. uh, it was absolutely dead air. There mm -hmm. was no air moving downrange. Uh, so you held straight on. Um, and uh, I missed my first shot by about a mil low. And that really confused me because uh, the ballistics on my gun are known. It was zeroed perfectly before I came out. Uh, and I had great chronograph numbers. I was using the same ballistic profile that I've used in the past for long range shooting with that rifle. Uh, so the fact that I dropped a mil low really confused me. Um, it took a couple of shots before I was sure that that's what was going on. Um, I was able to come up and I was able to get the slight, there was a little bit of wind drift for me downrange that I wasn't feeling, uh, but I was able to see the impacts on the berm and uh, get shifted over and then get on. And I connected with the thousand yard target. Uh, the way you went, you had two shots on each target, hit or miss, you moved after two shots. Uh, so... I've managed to make a hit on the 1,000-yard target. I think I got a hit on the 850 and the 800. I think I got one for one on each of those because I came off the stage with three points, uh, and I had a malfunction somewhere in the middle of the stage that uh, robbed me of a lot of time, and I actually ended up timing out on the stage. Uh, what the problem was is I had a primer come out of a piece of brass as it ejected, uh, and that locked the gun up and caused me to have to drop the magazine and clear the gun and get it back up and running, and again, cost me a lot of time. And when I collected the brass afterwards, most of the brass uh, was missing primers. Uh, so that was the first indication <laughs> of the pretty significant problem that was to come. Uh, so I packed my stuff up and came off the stage with uh, three points, which actually uh, overall uh, was not horrible for that stage, uh, but it was pretty horrible for my level of shooting. 
Um, I came off the stage with none because, uh, as my husband had mentioned, there's a difference when someone else zero is your gun. Um, it, it, like my like he said, it it was very straightforward, dialing your dope and blessed no really no wind um, to really deal with. Um, but it, we knew coming off that stage something wasn't right, and we had planned to gather information on the next stage, uh, which would have been stage one for us, um, when it all just kind of fell apart for him, which left me another stage, but we'll, we'll get into that. So, and we were, uh, we were trying to spot as she was shooting. Cause one of the nice things about the guardian is there, there are no restrictions on the individual day on other, uh, squad mates. Uh, spotting for the shooter, uh, especially if they're having problems, they encourage you to get up and spot and and help work uh, with the other shooter. And we could see that she was somewhere around a mill off. Mm -hmm. um, this worried me a little bit because when I re-zeroed her rifle uh, for the hand loads that we had rolled up, I had to come left nine tenths of a mill from what the gun was originally dialed. Uh, and zero that out. So of course it's creeping into my head. Hey, did I, did I dial off? But uh, she was impacting one mill right, uh, so that would have been another mill left adjustment. So it wasn't the opposite of what I dialed on because that would have made it very simple. Uh, if she was impacting one mill left, then I would have just brought her gun back to center uh, where she had it before I messed with it, uh, and we would have been good to go. But that wasn't the case. It was actually a cumulative error. Uh, so, um, we, we still didn't know exactly what was going on with it as we came off the stage. And as I said, there were, there were other things going on. There was the rain, there were, uh, issues with, uh, moisture in the gun. There mm -hmm. were issues with, with shooters getting comfortable after, you know, layering up. And we were la wearing three to four layers mm -hmm. in this because, uh, it wasn't just the rain, it was that wet, biting cold that you had as well that we were dealing with. And it got colder as the day went on. So uh, that was our first stage, that was stage nine. And then we had to walk all the way over to the other stage to stage one. And for those of you guys that haven't shot at Frontline, Frontline is a really nice facility because almost all the ranges are online. Uh, there were a There was one stage that you had to go uh, a little bit forward versus a straight, strict mm -hmm. line. Uh, but there were no lines of fire that intersected. There were structures in that between there. So you could safely move to each one of the firing points mm -hmm. uh, while all the stages were hot uh, without any safety concerns. Uh, and that's really nice. It It's much more difficult to move around and do things, especially if you have equipment issues or you need to go back to the car for something. Uh, it's much more difficult on stages where you have to cross lanes of fire in order to get back to another area. Uh, Frontline is set up very, very well. It's a very nice facility and um, Paul keeps improving it. Mm -hmm. Every time we go out there, uh, there are more structures, there are better ranges, there are better things set up. So mm -hmm. uh, it's an absolutely amazing place to go shoot and it's set up very well to host these kind of matches. So our next stage was stage one, and stage one was a railroad tie wall that was set up uh, with different firing ports in it. And uh, the time limit for each of these stages was 90 seconds. So you had 90 seconds to fire 10 shots. Uh, shooters engaged the target, which was 509 yards, uh, from five different positions using the railroad ties to engage a target, after every two shots from a position, shooter must move to the next position using the railroad ties for support. And the positions were uh, had spray painted marks over mm -hmm. them. I believe we went uh, across the two ties, then prone. underneath. Mm -hmm. So you went prone underneath and then over top of the ties and then back through the port. Yep. And then you finished on a I'll four tie top. stack on the right hand side. Uh, so two shots from each of those positions, 90 seconds, uh, you had to be really moving to get your shots off. So um, I got set up, got my dope dialed onto the rifle, got ready to go, uh, got my time, dropped down to position number one, got in position, fired my shot, and I knew right off the bat, it didn't feel right. The rifle recoiled, ejected, it went to chamber the next round, and I knew it was a malfunction right away. So 
flip the brass catcher aside, I go to clear the malfunction, and the charging handle was frozen. Uh, it wasn't moving at all. So, of course, I do the next best thing. You know, rifle's on safe. I slam it onto the ground, mortar the buttstock, trying to pull the charging handle back to try to eject the round. Um, and, again, it's locked up solid. I, I bang it a couple of times. And at that point, you realize you've blown the stage. So now it's time to put the brakes on, slow down, uh, figure out what's going on. So you know automatically at that point you're going to take a zero for the stage. Uh, so now it's time to safely figure out what's going on with the gun. So that's something I really want to impress. Uh, if you are in a situation uh, where your rifle causes you a serious problem and it's not a real fast immediate action fix, um, when you know you've blown the stage already, uh, just stop. Now it's more important that you safely handle the weapon uh, than it is that you clear it and get back up on the clock. So uh, we went ahead and stopped. The RO came over. We took a look at it. We had a problem because the bolt carrier group is frozen forward, and I was pretty sure it was frozen forward on a live round, which creates a safety concern on the stage because I can't walk off the stage with a hot gun. Uh, so, of course, we dropped the magazine, did what we could to clear it. It wasn't coming apart. Uh, thankfully, I was able to punch the pins on the rifle and separate the upper from the lower. Uh, so even though there was a live cartridge in it, there was absolutely no way that that cartridge could fire uh, with the upper and lower separated. Uh, when I got it apart, I looked at it and I could see that the bolt was a quarter inch out of battery, uh, which means the firing pin couldn't even contact the primer if you stuck a screwdriver in and whacked on it. Uh, so the gun was perfectly safe once the upper and lower were separated. I went ahead and took it off the stage. I uh, took it back to the car, took a look at it. Again, I took uh, took my multi-tool out and took the screwdriver on it and tried to lever the bolt carrier group back and uh, realized that I just not had the right tools for the job there. Uh, I was going to slip. I was going to tear up the inside of the aluminum receiver or something. So I decided, okay, uh, we'll put the gun away, put it up, and uh, that will be it. Uh, so I went ahead and uh, put the gun away, came back, and uh, decided just for the rest of the match, I would be a support team for Sarah. <laughs> well, I don't think he really painted a, an accurate visual of this stage, because when you hit that first um, rear tie, you went down to your knees. And you between shooters, it was enough time, the rain was falling hard enough that when you hit it, it just went sploosh. And you had this big mud puddle hit. So then imagine him on his knees in the mud, banging his rifle on the ground in the mud. It was quite comical. So I just want to make sure y'all get the full visual effect on that. I, I do wish somebody had <laughs> some video of that because um, mortaring a rifle is not a gentle thing to begin with. Um, and this, I was really irritated, first of all, that it failed. Uh, so I banged on it pretty good. And as I said, if you want to know exactly how it failed, uh, go ahead and check out the Mail Call Mondays from yesterday. I'll tell you real quick that... Uh, what actually ended up happening was uh, one of the primers from the once-fired brass that I was using uh, came out of the back of the brass case, landed on the next round. That got picked up and driven into the uh, locking lug recess in the barrel extension, and the bolt went to lock up. And it actually, I think it pinched the piece of primer cup uh, between the two lugs. So normally where that primer cup will just prevent lockup and you can pull it out, shake the primer cup out and get going. Uh, this time it actually sheared a piece of the primer cup and stuck between the lugs and it locked it up solid. In order to get it back apart, I had to get it back here in the shop, uh, put the upper receiver in a bench vise and I had to use a brass punch and a hammer uh, to drive the bolt carrier group back out with enough force to get the bolt to rotate and let everything go. Uh, the rifle's fine now, but it definitely was not something uh, that I was going to fix in the field without causing greater damage to the rifle. So, And so, and real fast too, before I get on to my point of this stage, there was every, every single person but one, and I don't blame him because he just saw how he shot his rifle, rifle so he wasn't going to offer his rifle. Every single person said, do you want to shoot my rifle? I have an extra rifle in the truck. Do you want, to go, want me to go get it? And it was it was one of those, hey, you came to shoot. We're going to shoot. And he, he was, no, I wanted to shoot the Mod 10. So he, he just basically became, um, you know, my concierge and my, <laughs> my Sherpa, as you want to call it. Um, but in the midst of all of that, with this stage, again, still having my, um, my true zero issue and wanting someone to call wind for me um, due to the weather and due to the pouring rain, most of the shots 
were untraceable. There were no call. You couldn't you couldn't see where they went. So hitting that mill to the wrong is it, well, and there's a little education on that too. But hitting what they were thinking was a mill wrong, we couldn't call. I couldn't fix it because they couldn't call it for me. Also, there was a little learning curve for me. Again, I my personal learning deficit is spatial awareness. Don't ask me to hang a picture. It won't be straight. So when my husband said, hold to the left, in my brain, move my target to the left, not move my crosshairs to the left. Um, did I even say that right? Yeah. Okay. See, it's yep. till this to this day, in, in when he would say, move to the left, I would have to in my, actually I said it out loud, move your crosshairs left because he kept saying, hold left. So I put the target on the left. So really I was holding right. So I started getting pretty darn ticked off at this point and because I could didn't have any information to fix my rifle and I knew I shot better than that and there was nothing I could do at that moment to fix any of it. So it's uh, and that that's a failing on my part because we we both work full time jobs and I I hate to say it, but a lot of times when we have time together uh, going out to the range <laughs> and shooting rifles is not the top on the list of things that we want to do together. Uh, so it's been a while since we've been able to get out and actually shoot and do some uh, spotter shooter drills where I'm coaching her onto target and that and vice versa. Uh, she has not spent a lot of time on the scope uh, spotting for me and believe it or not, that will actually make you a better shooter. Being on the scope and spotting, spotting for someone else uh, will teach you a whole lot about how the bullets go and what to say to the shooter uh, to get them back on target. Uh, and because of that little glitch between the communication, it made it very difficult because we would um, occasionally catch trace. Uh, and it was a very, very bad day for actually trying to see tra bullet trace going down range. And if you can't see impacts and you can't see trace, then you yeah, have nothing. really no way to yep. shift. So occasionally we would catch the trace or we would catch splash down range and we would tell her to shift and then the next round would impact the wrong direction. And we're <laughs> I like, would shift. <laughs> we're like, wait a minute, is that is that the what gun? Is, is there something <laughs> coming loose on the gun or what's going on? So, so that's operator the, error. <laughs> but I will say on the... Um, on the whole issue with uh, loaner guns, I have a safe full of loaner guns. If I really, if shooting the match was the highest priority on my list, um, I could have very easily thrown a case of factory ammo and a loaner gun in the car or a backup gun in the car and then just shifted over and shot a backup gun. Um, I, I, in fact, have another 6.5 Creedmoor semi-automatic rifle that's sitting in the safe that we're reviewing, the MSR-10 right now. Uh, so it would have been very easy for me to throw the MSR-10 and the factory ammo that I have ready for the MSR-10 uh, into the car. That wasn't the point of it. The point of it was for me to come out. I wanted to shoot the Ma-10. Uh, I wanted to just come out and associate with other shooters. And if I wasn't able to shoot the Ma 10, I really want to go through it and shoot another rifle. I'm more effective uh, shooting video and shooting photos and doing what I need to do on the media side if I'm not actually shooting the match. So, um, but I do want to send a great shout out to every single one of you guys that stopped me and said, Hey, uh, I've got a spare gun. You can shoot my gun. Uh, Gary Larson offered me his mm -hmm. gun. Uh, Paul Smith, the range owner, offered me to, to get me one of his guns to shoot. Uh, some of you guys, even on the internet, were yeah. offering to get a gun to yeah, me. Yeah, Matt uh, Dover uh, was going to drive one up so he could shoot the team match on Sunday. So so thank you very much for those of you guys that that offered me a rifle. And again, I... I I believe it's it's not just because it was me. I think if we had just about anybody uh, that had a gun mm -hmm. go down like that, they would be offering their gun up to them. Yeah. So it's just a great community, uh, and I want to thank you guys for it. So the next stage that we shot was stage two, and stage two was the truck sale or truck stage. I say truck sale because the stage name is actually Dodge for Sale, and they've got the big blue Dodge Ram out there that's all beat up. And better uh, days. the target for this one, we have single target at 787 yards. Um, on the start signal, shooters were to engage the target from five different positions using the pickup truck to engage the target placed at 787 yards. After every two shots from a position, shooter must new move to the next position. Uh, so this is 
pretty much just like the last stage, mm -hmm. but with a different yardage to the target. And what really makes each one of these stages difficult is the positions mm -hmm. that you're shooting from. Uh, in the truck, um, I've shot a very similar stage to this the last time mm -hmm. I was down here at Frontline. And uh, you wouldn't think that shooting from a truck would be a huge pain in the butt, okay. but it is a huge pain in the butt. Almost none of the positions are at the right height for you, no matter what size shooter you are. Mm -hmm. it, it's like some kind of black magic going on there. <laughs> <laughs> that no matter where you go on that truck, the point you have to shoot at is at the wrong height. It is. So, um, overall, it, it, it's a good time, but everybody seemed to have trouble with the tailgate unless you were a left-handed no, shooter. No, I did not have trouble with the tailgate, so he needs to close his mouth. Um, so, the five positions. Prone, hood, bed of the truck, tailgate of the truck, prone again. And the problem with the tailgate is that it was a tiny little tailgate. It was, it was skinny. So me and, oh gosh, a couple other people just folded forward at the waist and put ourselves in front of that, that um, tail light there. But you got these big old beefy boys who come out with shoulders, and I'm not naming names, but, you know, they can't, they can't get in there. They end up shooting with, uh, with the wrong eye or going offhand uh, the wrong side, just trying to get the shots off where they just don't even aim and just boom, boom, so they can get down to the prone. Just know they're going to blow those two shots. Mm. And the, the truck was set at just a slight mm -hmm. angle, too. Uh, so if you weren't careful, if you were snuggled up too close to that tail light, you could clip the other side of the bed going <laughs> across. So you, you really had to be cognizant of that. And the, the truck was at an angle as well. Mm -hmm. So you had to make sure that you had your bipod set enough uh, that you still had elevation at the back. And then, of course, that can screw you when you drop down to prone. Mm -hmm. At least on this one, we weren't shooting through the windows of the truck. Uh, through the open windows. Uh, right. The last time I had to shoot this stage, you had to shoot across the driver's side door uh, through the passenger side window, and that was a huge pain again because uh, the truck was not sitting level. You mm -hmm. had to make sure uh, that if you snuggled up to uh, the door jam, uh, that you weren't going to send a bullet into a piece of upholstery or into the door on the opposite <laughs> side. Uh, so depending upon how they do the stage the next time, because I'm sure this truck is going to appear <laughs> again uh, if you shoot frontline, um, then that's something that you really need to be aware of. Um, again, time limit was 90 seconds, so you had to be scooting. Uh, you had to get down, get your shot, and then you really had to be on it as soon as you fired that shot to get to the next position. Uh, with stages like these, where I see a lot of shooters mess up is they will fire the first shot, fire their second shot, and then they will try to grade the shot or they'll wait to listen for a hit or they'll wait to hear some kind of call from somebody. Uh, don't do that. You know you only have two shots from each position. As soon as you press the trigger on that second shot, it should be bolt back or weapon on safe and roll to the next position. And I'll mention this um, just because this is kind of standard across matches like this, but some of you that haven't shot matches before uh, may not understand how this works. When you are on a stage where you have to move position to position, uh, you have to place the gun in a safe condition before you can move uh, for obvious reasons. But with a bolt action rifle, the safe condition is bolt up and back. Uh, they don't require you to actually engage the manual safety on a bolt action rifle, uh, but the bolt has to be up and to the rear because there's no chance of a bolt action rifle firing if the bolt is up into the rear, and the RO can very clearly see that the rifle's in a safe condition when you do that. Uh, Semi-auto rifles are a little bit different because that is a difficult thing to do to lock the bolt back, and it would really uh, handicap you running a semi-auto uh, so for semi-automatic rifles, you had to rotate the safety selector into safe position and you had to call out audibly on safe or safe before you move to your next position. Uh, that way the RO knows your brain told you to engage the safety lever and move. You still couldn't break 180 with the muzzle of your rifle. That would get you DQ'd. So it's still downrange, but you need to make sure that the weapon's in a safe condition, especially moving in wet and muddy conditions because mm -hmm. if you fall... Uh, very easy to cause that rifle to go off. And if you put around at close range into the side of a truck, there's still potential for some uh, injury uh, to yourself or people behind you. Uh, so when we're moving, that's the goal. Uh, make sure that the bolt is up and back or the semi-automatic rifles are on safe. And that's pretty standard uh, across uh, all um, precision rifle matches. All right, and stage three was our next stage, and the title on this <laughs> stage is 
Pipe Hitters Union. And uh, for those of us that run break rifles, anytime you see pipe in the title of a stage, you know it's going to suck. <laughs> um, so stage description here, the target, again, single target, 766 yards. Uh, it was uh, about Ipsic size. Uh, shooters engage the target from five different positions using the concrete tubes to engage a target placed at 766 yards. After every two shots from a position, shooters must move to the next position using the tubes for support. Um, That's not how they were set up. They were set up with two small tubes on the side, one large tube with two smaller tubes in the middle. Um, and there were lines spray painted. You had to have your muzzle ahead of... <laughs> ahead of the spray painted lines because breaks. And um, so it, it was very simple. You just went through them and made sure you hit your stages that you were supposed to. So I want to make sure that the brakes were actually <laughs> in the tube so you yeah. get the maximum amount of slap back in your face uh, when you with, shoot it. With mud and rain. That so was fun. It's, it's definitely one of those situations. There were a lot of suppressed guns because suppressed guns are uh, perfectly legal in North Carolina. Uh, there were a lot of suppressed rifles on the line, and this is definitely a match where I would recommend running a suppressor uh, if you have the ability to do so. That makes the uh, whole situation a whole lot nicer, mm -hmm. uh, especially in uh, the pipes or mm -hmm. uh, setups like that. Um, and... For those of you guys that are listening to us on the podcast, uh, we are putting up pictures uh, of the different stages uh, on the video. So make sure you flip over to our Full 30 channel or our YouTube channel and uh, check out uh, the actual videos when you get time. So again, that was fairly simple. Since you've got five positions, you only have one target. You only have one dope setting you got to worry about on the gun. And uh, at this point, we were actually getting a little bit of wind, I think. It started right. to pick up. The temp started to drop. The wind started to pick up. The suck level kind of started climbing a little more. <laughs> I think at this stage, I was like, you know what? I think we just might go home. I think those <laughs> words actually came out of my mouth and because I was frustrated. Again, I, was, uh, I think this was the stage I realized that I had no clue what he was talking about when holding um, target versus scope. So um, I, I was frustrated. And our next stage was a Learn Your Limits stage. And this was called Learn Your Limits Tears of Joy. <laughs> um, now, I, I don't know if it was Tears of Joy because this was one of the few stages where you didn't have to lay or kneel in the mud. Mm -hmm. Or uh, if it was Tears of Joy because uh, since it's a Learn Your Limits stage instead of a Know Your Limits stage, if you missed, you didn't lose all your points. Right. Uh, classically, a Know Your Limits stage um, you have to stop before you miss, because if you miss, you zero out the stage and you have to start over again. Uh, this one was not the case. Uh, the target rack was at 470 yards, and we were shooting a 8-inch, a 7-inch, a 6-inch, a 5-inch, and a 4-inch plate uh, in that order left to right. The barricade for this, or the obstacle from this, uh, was a full-size uh, Chevy Tabur Suburban or uh, Yukon. or something. Uh, yeah. Something of that nature, but it was a, a full-size Suburban-sized vehicle uh, placed horizontally across the stage, and then there was a staircase up the side of it, and you had to shoot from the roof of the Suburban. Uh, so... Again, it's not a technically difficult stage. You were standing. You had enough room to get the bipod on the roof, uh, get the rear bag mm -hmm. underneath the buttstock of the rifle. Uh, so really not a problem there. It's just a, a problem of uh, managing the recoil, getting on the target, and again, uh, 90 seconds for 10 shots. So making sure you manage your time well. And that since you started at the bottom of the staircase and there was mud all around the staircase... <laughs> Uh, the staircase was completely Just, covered in yeah. mud, and it was wet. So you had to make sure that going up, uh, you went up slow enough that you didn't fall and injure yourself or get DQ'd from the stage, um, but that you still uh, didn't burn any time getting up there. Yeah. Um, I actually got a hit on this, and I'm actually sitting here thinking about this, and it was probably because the targets were hanging on the same plate rack and so close together. And I don't even know if I hit the right target at the time, but I got a hit and I was praising Jesus. Good Lord, thank you, Jesus. Because lunch was after this and that's when we went and re-zeroed my rifle. And that's kind of when things turned around for me. Um, but yeah, this was very straightforward. 
the stage comes up on the second day very straightforward again so um this i don't think they're gonna move this truck so it's gonna i think it's gonna <laughs> be there for a while so that one again fairly straightforward um I'm not going to say it was an easy stage because again, he didn't shoot it. <laughs> that and the uh, again, the temperatures were dropping all through the day. So we were starting to get into our really cold section. And at this point, um, each one of the stages, thankfully, uh, they went and erected some kind of canopy. Mm -hmm, so the, the small pop up canopies that you can get at uh, Walmart or that. So there was at least a place uh, for us to huddle. Uh, usually the gear ended up out in the rain, but uh, shooters were able to huddle under the uh, tent and try to get a little bit out of the rain uh, before it was your turn to go. Uh, spotters, uh, we ended up standing out in the rain and uh, getting drenched. Not a big deal because uh, I was uh, completely wrapped in Arcteryx, <laughs> so uh, sealed up in Gore-Tex goodness. Uh, and uh, at that point, I didn't have to lay in the mud anymore, so it was kind of a good thing for me. Uh, but um, it was the temperature was dropping, and at that point, most shooters, um, if they weren't fully encased in Gore-Tex, were starting to get wet, and at sure. least your your hands would get wet and mm -hmm. really start to uh, cause you some issues. Because um, in my experience, uh, 40 degrees and wet is far, far worse than zero degrees and snow, uh, because at least zero degrees and snow, you're dry. Um, but when you get wet and you start to drop down into those just above freezing temperatures, it can cause some real big problems really quickly. It was uh, about this time that someone started passing out hand, those hand warmers, um, kind of cautioning those people that were dressed in jeans that you probably need to put some more clothes on kind of stuff. So. There were actually people there that were wearing uh, blue jeans and hoodies and, and things of that nature. So um, I, I feel for those guys, uh, more power to them to tough it out. Yeah. But uh, we were we were definitely wearing uh, some uh, good synthetic insulation mm -hmm. and Gore-Tex and, and all that fun stuff to, to keep the cold out and manage it as best as possible. Mm -hmm. And I know some of you guys up there in Canada are laughing at me <laughs> when I talk about 40 degrees and cold. Um, but you know what I'm talking about as far as that. Uh, wet and uh, you get your core wet, you start to get hypothermia real quick. That Thankfully, shiver. that was not a problem. Nobody uh, that I know of went down with hypothermia, but uh, I think that did uh, cause a couple of withdrawals uh, from the match once you it get did. soaked through and are miserable. So we had lunch at that point, and uh, they kind of did lunch on the roll. Uh, as it was ready, they would call a uh, squad in. You would go up to the big circus tent that they had set up behind the main building. <laughs> And uh, they had catered in barbecue, and I forget offhand who did the catering for the barbecue, but it was a uh, good classic North Carolina barbecue. Uh, so we went up, got a warm meal. Uh, nothing was hot at that point, but it was at least warm, <laughs> and it was food in the belly. Mm -hmm. uh, so we got recharged, and at that point, we thankfully there was a bottleneck at mm -hmm. one of the stages. That we were headed and to, yeah. so we had enough time to run over to the zero range uh, because... Paul did leave one of his ranges open, I guess, for, for regular mm -hmm. members to come and go, and that was the 100-yard range. Uh, so we go over there real quick. We found a uh, target that wasn't uh, too badly shot up, uh, got her on it, and fired a shot, and uh, we were got her zeroed. We were seven-tenths of a mil off um, is what the difference between his bearded face and my non-bearded face is. Yep. Um, and and we nope, I'm three tenths of a mil. I'm actually checking because I haven't gone back and reset this since we cleaned it up until we get a chance to actually go out and shoot here on our home range again. But it was it was three tenths of a mil off. So after we got the the rifle rezeroed, we actually were able to um, go back and and hang out with the crew for just a little bit longer. And we we went to the the fifth stage, which was called the Barrel of Monkeys, and this was or commonly called the mud pit because it truly was a pit of mud um john took some pictures where boot prints were filled oh it was awful just awful yeah so this one uh as she says barrel of monkeys the target was 352 yards away so a relatively close target uh, i don't recall the exact target size uh everything on our stage description looks like uh, full-size ipsic targets um but uh, in this case, I believe, was this the one with the, it was a circle target on a stick? 
I, it's like a jalapeno. I, I don't stick. recall like a jalapeno <laughs> on a stick. Hopefully Jeff Dunham won't sue me for that. <laughs> so, sorry, Jeff. But, we like your stuff. So um, the target's relatively close in. It was uh, at least a two MOA or better target. I think it was quite a bit larger in this case. Uh, but shooters had to engage a target from five different positions using the barrels. Mm -hmm. After every two shots from position, the shooter must move to the next position using the barrels. Mm -hmm. um, and the barrels were set at uh, various angles. So the first one was uh, perpendicular to you. No. Oh, dear Lord. See, I think the first one was... Spatial awareness. Here's the spatial awareness. No, that was the second one because I liked that one. So the first one was long ways. Okay. The second one faced the target lengthways. And the third one was standing tall. Um, and the, the most stable position was that middle one that you could truly just get your get yourself on that, by, that barrel and get your bipod up there and just you have that whole length to lay on. Um, I don't know how many I got, but I got some. Not all, but some, it made me happy. Well, this one, if I remember right, since it was five shooting positions, but you only had three barrels, you, did. you had to go down and then back. Back, yes. So you two, 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 two. So, and these are these are just plastic 50-gallon drums that mm -hmm. are sitting there. So they do have some give. They mm -hmm. do have some movement to them. Uh, so if you load them too aggressively, they will roll on you. Mm -hmm. uh, the trick is setting your gun up and setting your bags and your bipod and all this stuff up uh, so that what works on one barrel will work on the other barrels without a lot of change. Uh, guys that are running long magazines tend to have problems with barrels because you can't get the bipod back far enough for that horizontal barrel uh, to be able to get the bipod on and not have the magazine dig in and roll. So I definitely recommend if you have the ability to do so at your range, um, get a 50 gallon barrel, set it up, shoot off of it, various different configurations, straight, sideways, up, down, etc. cetera, um, because you will run into them time and time again, either a barrel stage or a pipe stage at a lot of different matches. Uh, and they're easy, they're fairly lightweight if you get the plastic ones. Uh, you just hope they don't do like they do at our range and guys go staple targets to them and then <laughs> shoot them. Um, they're not targets. They're not target stands either. Um, so that was the barrel stage, and that was the beginning of the turnaround for Sarah's match. Yes. So um, the next stage was stage six, and this was something new to um, the Guardian match is that there was um, a combo stage of rifle and handgun. So this stage, <laughs> I'm sorry, I just saw the name of it, it was Spinner Spinner Chicken Dinner. <laughs> <clears throat> and so how this stage worked is that um, you you made your um, handgun ready and it was sitting on a table um, at the back end of, I believe it was a Jeep Cherokee. Um, and then you had to engage other targets from the front of the Jeep Cherokee and prone. Um, let's see here. The, the first target was 289 yards and it was a hostage target. So you had a full F6 state target. And then over his left shoulder was mm -hmm. this little tiny plate, and you had to not shoot the hostage. Now, I asked if I liked the hostage, and if the hostage was my friend, no one really cared. If you shot the hostage, it was a negative points. I believe negative two points. Yep. And since my rifle had been shooting to the left all day, I did not even shoot the hostage taker. I didn't like the hostage that much. Second uh, target was right behind the a car. Uh, it was 297. Again, engaged two shots there. Um, make your rifle safe, bolt back, go down to the handgun stage. Well, and oh. there was a trick to the 297-yard target because oh, it was, it was actually a spinner, but only the top of the spinner was exposed. And a lot of guys forgot that it was a spinner or missed it in the stage brief, uh, so they would hit it, and it would go down. And you would have to wait for it to come back up and expose itself again uh, before you could hit it again. So, yes, so then you go down to the stage, the uh, handgun stage, where you had 25 total shots they said you could have. So you could have two full mags. I was running the 17, mm -hmm. the Glock 17, and I had two full mags. Um, the It started with a plate, a rack of plates that were five, and you had to get all the plates down before you could engage the targets behind, um, which ended up being an Ipsic. You put two on there with a flipper on the back. And then a spinner in the middle, and then another Ipsic with a flipper on the back. And those were two um, as well. Um, I'm sorry, one shot only on the spinner in the middle. Um, and I loved this stage. It was so nice to have just a transition to something different um, with 
the handgun. It was like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I like, I like this. Um, and it was total points were ridiculous. Uh, 17, 17 total points in one stage. So a lot of people were able to make up points here. I made up points here. Um, it really helped. And when you're, when you're gaming this stage, again, it was a 90 second time limit for the entire stage. Mm -hmm. Uh, so a lot of guys really, uh, if you spent a ton of time prone trying to shoot those rifle targets, uh, then you burned a ton mm -hmm. of time and you would time out on the pistol side, uh, where you had a ton of really easy points. Uh, so the smart thing to do would be, you know, take your sight picture, get your shots off, but get them off quickly on the rifle side. Uh, 289 yards uh, for that little uh, hostage head target, and then 297 yards uh, for the plate on the spinner. They're not difficult shots, especially since you shot both right. those prone. Right. Um, no, the first the first two, the hostage ones, you're laying across the hood of the Jeep. Okay. Uh, but anyway, it was both, it was bipod and rear back supported for both those. So right. not incredibly difficult, but you needed to make sure you got those quick. And then you really needed a move because you had about, um, about 10 to 15 yards uh, from one position over to the other position, get your pistol loaded up uh, and ready to go. And this is one of those where when you're gaming the stage, you sit back and you look at each Point where you're going to waste time and try to minimize that. Mm -hmm. So you're not shooting faster, but you need to move more efficiently from point to point. I was really, really bummed out that I didn't get to shoot this. Mm -hmm. It was uh, fun. Because it was so much fun. I, I was running uh, my uh, Danger Close Armament uh, Glock 19 with an RMR on it, and uh, this stage would have been money. The plate rack was close enough that mm -hmm. I could have just annihilated it with a dot side <laughs> equipped handgun. Uh, and there were some guys that were running dot side equipped guns. It was basically, uh, for lack of any other type of classification, it was an open pistol stage. So you could run whatever kind of mm -hmm. pistol you wanted to run. Uh, and since it was starting uh, with the empty pistol laying on the table, you really didn't have to worry about different holster mm -hmm. configurations or anything. One thing that you did want to do, because I noticed a couple of guys that kind of goofed this up, um, we have one guy that kept his pistol in the holster on mm -hmm. the table, which I didn't quite understand. Remove the pistol from the holster and have it sitting there. Uh, ideally, if I could, I would have the slide locked back and open uh, so that all I have to do is insert the magazine, drop the slide, and come up, and I'm ready to go. Um, sitting <laughs> the Setting the magazines down. You set the magazines down with the bullets up, spine down, so as soon as you grab that magazine, your finger's indexed on the front of the magazine, and in it goes. Um, guys have shot USPSA stages before we start from a table. Um, those are all pretty obvious things on how you arrange your handgun on the table. Uh, you arrange the pistol in an orientation so that you're closing your hand on it and immediately picking it up. Uh, that way you get your fire and grip right off the table and you don't have to goof around. If you flip it the wrong side, then you've got to pick it up, turn it around, and orient it. Um, Sarah got to shoot the uh, Gen 5 Glock 17 for mm -hmm. this. And, uh, I had a malfunction on it, so I didn't even realize it was malfunction. I wasn't counting, and I thought I was out of rounds because my 42 only carries six plus one. So I just drop the mag and load the other mag in, and he's like, "Malfunction!" yelling at me. I'm like, so at that time the timer went off anyway, and I looked. I'm like, "Oh look, my slide's halfway jammed on a on a live round." So for whatever reason, it stovepiped on uh, one of the cartridges, and this. Uh, Handgun's fairly new. It's probably got a couple hundred rounds through it, but uh, I I honestly have no idea if it was a low power cartridge that caused the malfunction or if it was anything else. That it's a uh, it's a Glock, so it's uh, incredibly reliable. But uh, this was the first chance for it to get covered in mud too, <laughs> because everything was covered in mud <laughs> except um, him. He really wasn't covered in mud. Yeah. No, not so at all. I I was trying my best, but uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, it got soaked and covered in mud. So. So, so two stages left to talk about day one. Um, day, stage seven was the barricade charade. And the biggest thing I remember about this um, is that the temperature dropped drastically um, between the two stages and everyone started shivering. Um, so this was where uh, you had one target. It was 500 yards out. And you had to engage the target from five different shooting positions on your typical PRS barricade Um multiple levels the rules were you couldn't use the same spot twice and you had to go from different levels you could return to your level but you had to move to a different level before you came back to your level um 
let's see. Uh, I think that it was pretty straightforward. Um, most guys gamed it. So mm -hmm. target was at 500 yards. And um, this is one again, where you, you really have to listen to the stage brief because it got a couple mm -hmm. of guys. Uh, the barricade was a, a fairly open barricade, lots of positions to choose from, but you had to change levels before you could go to an adjacent port. So you couldn't just shoot this port and then go to this mm -hmm. port. You had to shoot this port, go up or go down, and then you could come back and shoot this port. And it, obviously there, there's a reason for that. You don't want to be able to set up your shooting position and shoot up your set up your gun and then just shoot across the barricade and only have to change uh, height mm -hmm. one time because changing the height uh, is the thing that will really get you. And this one you could not use prone. That was one level mm -hmm. you could not use. And the uh, and it's funny to listen to the well. What if I do this? What <laughs> if I do that? What if I do this? And actually, at one point, uh, they had to call Paul over. Uh, to uh, give a ruling on one of the positions because the guys wanted to use the, uh, the tree frog position. Yeah. So it's basically, it's prone kneeling, if you can envision that in your head. It's where the gun would be on the ground, your arms and your elbows would be on the ground, your knees would be on the ground, but your chest and your upper body would not be. Uh, that's what we commonly, commonly refer to as the tree frog position because you're all uh, crunched up. I think they said Paul's it. head exploded on that question so, so. <laughs> but yeah that that it they considered if the gun is flat on, on the, the ground, ground that's was a no. prone position um so there was that and uh, one other thing that i see guys doing a lot on barricades like this if you have an l in a barricade uh get the gun mm -hmm. against the vertical of the l and if you pinch the gun in there it will generally be more stable, stable. than mm -hmm. if you're out in the middle of a horizontal flat area so get the gun against it uh that's assuming you're not running a semi-auto gun where that would block the port and cause a malfunction uh, if you run a bolt gun then there's really no reason not to drive it in there uh, you'll see a lot of guys that will have rashed up uh, scope turrets because they'll drive it against the side or they'll have uh, skid tape on the side of their optic. And it's because they do punch the side of the gun against the barricade and hold it in that position. Um, so our last stage is stage eight. I'll find it. Um, and it was called the Sawhorse Course. So this one um, uh, involved a your standard wooden sawhorse and it, it was a sponsored stage by armageddon gear um, and they provided three bags that you could um, use all three or use none of them or use two depending whatever you wanted to and you would use the bags get on the sawhorse and engage targets there were three different targets um 504 592 and 645 and much like the barrel of monkey stage you shot two 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 and then came back for the other two targets for your last four shots um, this one, um, really, if you knew what you were doing with your bags, you could, it was pretty stable. Um, you were just really cold at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the, the sawhorse was oriented down range. Yes. So the length of the sawhorse was aiming at the target. And, uh, that of course made it a little bit more difficult because it's, you don't shoot it like a standard barricade. You want to get as much gun as you can on the sawhorse. So both the front and the rear of the gun are supported. Uh, the bags that were provided were a smaller sized rear bag, and I don't know what Armageddon Gear calls each one of these, right. unfortunately. I should have gone and looked it up before we rolled, but I didn't. Uh, the middle sized bag was a game changer, which most of you guys know what that looks like. It's like two triangles mm -hmm. stuck together. And then the other one was a large uh, square type bag or rectangle type bag. And uh, what most guys that were successfully shooting this, and pretty much what Sarah did on this one, is you would take the game changer and put the game changer horizontally across the, uh, the sawhorse with the points down, and then you would set your bipod up so that the bipod legs were on the game changer because the bipod legs would push down on the outside of the game changer, and that would cause it to pinch in and give you a relatively solid side-to-side uh, -side support so the gun didn't want to twist off. Uh, there were guys that put uh, bags flat across the front and then tried to lay the gun on it, and the gun wants to roll over when you do that. Uh, so a bunch of us spoke about it, um, and we had pretty much the, the, the consensus. same uh, yeah. consensus on how to do it. There were some guys that tried other stuff. Some were successful, some were not. Uh, the rear bag was just kind of a best guesstimate on what style of bipod you were running as to 
uh, which one of the rear bags you needed to give you the appropriate height. And I think you ran the larger of the rear bag. No, I didn't. I ran um, the smaller of the rear bags because that's what I was used to. Um, and I'm used to when I have don't have it completely supported. I'm used, I have a way that I hold it. That's just kind of something I've adapted to. So that was uh, that was kind of nice, uh, especially for newer shooters that didn't have their own gear. Mm -hmm. They could come up, and that was the only three bags that you were allowed to use on the stage. So no matter what you brought with you, uh, you could only use those three bags and your gun on that stage. Uh, now, again, with gear, for the most part, with the exception of this stage, gear was unlimited. You could bring as many bags or as many support accessories as you wanted, uh, with the exception of tripods. No tripods were allowed. Mm -hmm. uh, there were no stages that you shot off a tripod at this match. Uh, so that was about it. But um, in almost every case, if a shooter did not have a piece of equipment. Uh, there were guys lining up to offer to loan them a piece of equipment. Uh, so that that's just the guardian overall. If you if you don't have something or if you'd like to try something different, uh, there are usually a ton of guys that are ready to line up to offer you gear uh, to use if uh, you are wanting to try it out. So um, the. That was it for uh, day one. Uh, we adjourned back to the circus tent, put everything up, uh, tried to get the gear uh, organized as best mm -hmm. as possible. Because again, at this point, uh, it's all soaking wet. It's all muddy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably the worst possible conditions at the end of a match because you're trying to get this crap back into your car and you're trying to get organized into a state to where you don't have to unpack <laughs> the whole car when you get to the hotel parking lot because all the wet gear has to go into the hotel room. All the wet guns have to go into the hotel room so you can break them down, mm -hmm. open your scope caps, air everything out, and do some basic maintenance so it will run the next day. Uh, we did have to wait until they could get scores tabulated uh, for the match. And the top lady shooter for day one uh, was Ashley Shelburne. Mm -hmm. uh, top LE and military was Keith Pilgrim. Uh, top open class shooter was Matthew Enig. And top tactical was Clint Nicholson. And uh, so day one was all an individual effort. And uh, they handed out trophies and uh, awarded the, the prizes based on where you finished on that. Uh, then they went through and they asked who wasn't going to show up for day two. And unfortunately, there were a lot of us that didn't show up on day two. Of course, I had to withdraw because I wasn't going to go borrow a gun and then shoot the team side of things. Um, it also kind of wouldn't have been fair the way they set their system up because uh, when I looked at the scores, because I did get my three hits, mm -hmm. I was not absolute last place shooter, but I was ranked right at the bottom of the scorecard. Uh, so that would have teamed me up with uh, first or second place shooter on the second day and uh, putting me with a first place shooter with a gun that actually works <laughs> that I've got data for uh, would skew things a little bit from the way that they're intended. So I also didn't want that to factor into things. Uh, so once they figured out who was going to be there on day two, they went through and they paired up the teams. And the way they pair the teams is, again, uh, first place shooter, with last place shooter would be a team. And then second place shooter with second to last would be a team. And they go back through until you get to the middle of the list, which is kind of a funny way of doing it. I understand why they do it this way, but what you end up doing then is you have a team that's starting with a really, really skilled shooter and a uh, fairly novice shooter. And then you get in the middle, you've got a team that both shooters are pretty equivalent skill level. Um, so, it just depends. I don't think there's a right way to do it or a wrong way to do it. I think the way that they're doing it now works for the purpose of the match, which is not to uh, be super competitive, but it is to do kind of a uh, pro-am type setup or a mentor type setup. Mm -hmm. So you have a really experienced shooter and a less experienced shooter uh, getting to benefit from mm -hmm. each other. Uh, so they would pair those shooters up. And then once you got your teammate and you got everything squared away, you were good to go back. And we ended fairly early because they decided uh, to run the raffle on the second day instead of running it on the first day like has happened in the past. Uh, so we were out of there, able to get back, uh, get our gear unpacked, and uh, then go pig out at Cracker at, Barrel. Uh, Cracker Barrel. It, this is one of those things that when you get later in the day, 
Um, beer and food starts to rise in importance mm -hmm. in the priority level, and it's less about shooting and more about dreaming about beer and food, <laughs> especially when you're wet and cold. And so for some reason, at the end of the day, everybody was talking about this Coca-Cola cake at Cracker Barrel. Mm -hmm. And I apologize for you guys that are not uh, here in the U.S. Uh, because you won't be able to take part in this absolute delicacy. <laughs> but Cracker Barrel actually has this really heavily chocolate loaded cake that they apparently mm. use Coca-Cola to make in some way, shape or form. I don't know. I couldn't taste Coca-Cola. All I could taste was the chocolate, chocolate and ice cream. It was excellent. It was amazing. Uh, it was a great capper to the day, especially with the carb and grease loaded <laughs> Cracker Barrel refuel that we it did that amazing. night. Uh, so everybody went back. We cleaned gear, uh, wiped down the guns and oiled them up as best as possible. The main concern was just making sure everything is opened up and aired out. Mm -hmm. uh, so matches like this where you're wet and you're muddy, uh, taking care of the gear is really of primary importance because... Um, if you have a finicky trigger, you're going to want to flush that trigger out and make sure that it's uh, properly lubricated and you don't have any grit or mud or water that's going to go in there and cause all kinds of problems. Uh, you want to make sure that nothing is making its way into the bolt raceways. Uh, Semi-auto guns, I find, are usually less picky, but I mean, you still want to rip that bolt carrier group apart, wipe everything down, lube it back up, and put it together. Uh, one thing that I will caution you against doing is don't pull the action out of the chassis as much as you really want to do so. Unless you think there's something wrong, don't separate the action from the chassis. Uh, that could cause a zero shift, and that may give you some real heartache on day two. Uh, but everything else, go ahead and wipe it down. Save breaking the action out of the chassis until you're done with the match and you get back home. So that was day one. And mm -hmm. day two was actually an absolutely beautiful morning. It was. And before we kind of get started on day two, Paul um, Smith, the owner of Frontline there, stayed and reworked things because there had been stages that were going to have us on our belly again on Sunday and he went and reset stuff so that there were absolutely no prone stages. Um, the worst that you were going to be doing is kneeling in mud. So, um, he kind of put forth the effort and stayed up late that night, just doing some things to make sure it was right. Then, then they also decided to eliminate the pistol stage from day two. Uh, there was a pistol component mm -hmm. to one of the stages, but they de decided that uh, the movement from the pistol stage to the rifle stage or vice versa uh, was going to be a little bit uh, too slippery. Yeah. Uh, so they didn't want to worry about uh, people falling on that stage. And they also didn't want the ROs to have to slog down through the swamp mm -hmm. uh, to reset. They were going to have, a, uh, I believe, a Texas Star as uh, one of the pistol stages. And so those of you that are familiar with that, you knock the plates off of it. Somebody actually has to go back and put the plates back on each mm -hmm. of the arms of the star uh, to reset it for the next shooter. So there's no easy way to reset it. You do have to go down range and set it up. So uh, he did eliminate that. Mm -hmm. So we came together and, uh, of course, uh, like always happens, there were some, some jumbling and some resetting of teams. There was, yeah. Two. So we, we thought we had the teams... But later that evening, we got an email that kind of kind of shook team members up a little bit. So we found our team members. Like you said, it was a gorgeous day. However, it was like 32 degrees. <laughs> so I, I don't do cold. Just don't. And so I, I had my hand warmers and just made the best of it. Um, lots of jackets and, and coats. Um, I want to touch on the bases because we don't have a printout. So I'm going to kind of remember via these guys what the stages were as we kind of get to them. Um, but I, there was a few that were a lot of fun and really only done via the team members. And I'm going to be wrong in what stage number they were and what order they came in, but these are the ones that are sticking in my mind. The biggest focus of that team day, like John said, is about communication, about um, being able to correct for your spotter uh, or your spotter correcting for the shooter. And the, this was enforced by the ROs only calling hits. They wouldn't tell you you're, you're low and right. Um, that would be the, your partner's job. And it was to enforce that teamwork. Um, so the, the first stage, they, they changed to some tires, I do believe. Um, and so you just had different stages and you would split your, your bullet count or your round count. So one shooter would shoot five and then you would have to tag your partner and shoot five and so that's where the communication came in whether you had to um who was going to shoot first was the stronger shooter going to go or was the the 
the more inexperienced shooter going to go and have more time to get through these new scenarios and kind of work through them with a little bit of um, experience in their ear. So, so in each one of the stages was a 99 second right. time limit. They gave you a little bit of extra time. And uh, really, as you went through these stages, uh, the key thing was the partner handoff. Uh, most of the stages have one partner shooting and then having to hand off to the next partner. And uh, where guys really got tied up <laughs> was not communicating, it's your turn to go, and not doing it rapidly. Like, as soon as you fire your shot, go, and then the next teammate goes. And so mm -hmm. uh, there was some uh, some time that was uh, burned up in there. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I didn't shoot this. I was out there with the camera uh, running video. Uh, but from the last Guardian team match that I've shot, I can tell you that uh, communication is paramount. Uh, but then also deciding ahead of time, since this is a more experienced shooter and a less experienced shooter, um, you kind of have to decide what your goal is mm -hmm. and how to divide the duties. Um, do you really want to accumulate the most points possible or do you want to make sure that there's an even amount of shooting done from each one of the partners? Uh, or do you want the less experienced shooter to gain the most out of the match and just concentrate on getting them what they need to do to perform to a high degree? So that's really going to be the individual team because mm -hmm. uh, when I shot it, I found that it was very difficult if you are a competitive shooter and you're the guy that goes first. You want to get as many hits as you possibly can for your team, but that also eats up the lion's amount of the time and your partner may only get a couple of shots uh, before there's a time limit. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to discuss that with your partner and decide how you want to go about it, how you want to address that, and uh, that will smooth things over a little bit on uh, when it's your turn to go. Yeah. Um, stage two moved on to that Dodge truck again with that tailgate, which I had no problem with. One shooter shot from the hood, one shooter shot from the tailgate. Um, they shot five shots. I shot five shots. Um, the target was 787 on that again. Maybe. I don't know. I don't have, they gave us like an eighth of a piece of paper with all the ranges on them. So it truly was a fly by the seat of their pants, but it worked. So don't think that it didn't. Um, so with, with that, again, um, I had no problem with it because I could fit my shoulders past that tailgate. Um, stage three were the pipes. You shot on one top of, top of one pipe and you shot on another top of pipe, the other top of the pipe. Wow, that's easy for me to <laughs> say. What we found though, um, this is about when my partner, and his name is Warren, figured out that uh, everything was a low for me. So day one had a lateral shift. Day two, I had oh horizontal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or vertical see, shift. But see vertical shift. spatial awareness. Um vertical shift. And there's no way that anything could have gotten in my gun. There's no, you know, no dirt, mud, rocks, sand, grit, small rabbit. Anything could have jammed. So we just decided as a team that whatever my dope said, we were gonna add 0.4 to it. And once we did that, we were able to correct a lot of things. Um, I'm flipping here, guys. Sorry. Um, to the tears of joy were that learn your limit stage. The target was different. However, standing on top of that Tahoe again, um, they engaged, you engaged. It, it was truly teamwork. You know, go. Oh, I liked that. Um, so go. That's the biggest thing on that. Um, the fifth stage was actually the one I enjoyed the most. Um, it was uh, where the barrel of monkeys were, but they they put us on. Um, were the wire cable spools, great mm -hmm. big wooden, yep. yeah. Um, cable spools. Yeah. Yep. And so there was a top spinner and a bottom spinner and you each got 10 shots for a total of 20 points. So this was, this was the game changer round and you, your person would take one, one would be the top one would be the bottom. And so you would have to call top and shoot the top, bottom, shoot the bottom. And you would have to take turns back and forth. So the trick was not only communicating and yelling which target you were going to shoot, but knowing when to pull the trigger when that target was coming back at you. Um, I think we got 14 on this stage. It was nice. And I think one of them just was because oh, maybe we didn't call one. Um, so again, communication, being effective in time management on that communication so that you didn't waste your time doing that. And that was uh, a lot of 
a lot of it where guys got screwed up is they would they would not call and mm -hmm. it would it would cause a vapor lock because if you didn't call bottom and you fired the shot and it was an impact the uh, RO would not call impact and then it causes a brain freeze because you're like wait a minute I saw, I that. saw that impact. Mm -hmm. That was the target I was aiming at, but you didn't call it, so you didn't get points for it. I... Um, but a lot of shooters came off of that, and they were really happy about shooting the spinner stage. It looked like a really, it was really fun. fun stage. Oh my gosh, it was so much fun. Um, and that I do remember that one was 304. The range was 304 on that one. Um, by this time, the sun had come out. It started warming up. We were, I think, I had only had three jackets on instead of four at that time. So it was starting, the day was, you know, it was going our way. So it was turning out to be a pretty day. Um, the sixth stage where we did that spinner spinner chicken dinner was um, a, a team communication where both rifles laid down on the ground. Uh, I don't remember the yardage of the target, but you basically had to do a traveling burpee between the two rifles. Fire one from your rifle, burpee over to the other rifle, fire a shot, go back, fire another shot. You had, you could have up to 20 rounds. So you would hit five, tag your partner, they would get five. If you had time left, tag your partner again. Um, and this was when we realized my elevation was off even more and we had to keep dialing because I hit every target with my partner's gun. He didn't, and I didn't hit any with mine. So, um, and he had like an eight ounce trigger. It was insane. <laughs> um, so that was again, um, he, you know, you get together, let me see your scope. Let me look at it. He had really bad eyes. So he had to adjust it for me. Um, it was, it was interesting because then it added that physical element in also the mental of trying to shoot someone else's firearm. And that was, uh, again, that comes into that, that pro-am team mindset. Uh, one of the ideas behind that stage is that it gives it it gives a shooter that may be shooting whatever he can afford or whatever he can scrounge together a chance to shoot usually a much higher grade rifle and uh, get a chance to see how we can do with a higher grade rifle that has the dope dialed in that mm -hmm. is good to go. So uh, basically the, the opposite of what I stuck her with, <laughs> um, a gun that was a basket case for the uh, the match and that we definitely have some homework to do to get lined out. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely gave a shooter that maybe is not, doesn't have access to the top shelf gear, a chance to shoot some really high end stuff. And there was some really high end stuff mm -hmm. on the line out there. Uh, Accuracy Internationals, a bunch of high end uh, semi-automatic rifles, um, just you name it you can run into it at a guardian range. And then on the bottom end of the spectrum, uh, you guys, you've got guys out there that are running top loaders uh, with, you know, four or five round internal magazines. So it is really an interesting thing to see. Uh, and that's the whole core of the guardian matches. Don't be intimidated to come out mm -hmm. and shoot one uh, because you don't think you have the right gear. Come out and bring what you have as long as it shoots safely. And as long as you've done what you can do to gather the information you need beforehand, uh, bring it out and shoot it. Have some fun. I mean, even if you end up last place, you're still going to have a blast. So two two last stages, and we'll wrap it up here. Um, so stage seven was just a prone position, three targets to engage uh, nearest to far and then back to near. The mirage by this point of the day, I think it was like one in the afternoon, the mirage was so bad. Uh, there were, the like the highest hits on it were like four because it was... Um, not all, the wind had kind of picked up and it you, there you couldn't even call because the mirage was so bad there were no calls on all your misses um my partner carried me through that stage it was fine well and unfortunately on that um the mirage was bad but uh it was getting to conditions now where you could see trace but the whole idea of the team match is nobody mm, behind the line right. could coach anymore so you're watching the trace and you're like Ooh, I I could get them on, but you you can't do that because that's the whole idea. The teammates are supposed to be spotting for each other and able to get each other on. And I was totally wrong. What we just described was stage eight. Stage seven was the barricade course again. Um, ooh, and I'm I'm sad I forgot this because I'm very proud of me for this. So barricade stage five shots had to change all your positions. However, the first one had to be prone. And uh, we decided my partner would go first. Um, he did a lot of barricade work, so he went first. I got up there, went to shoot, uh, shot my first prone. I was just off the right edge, and then I had a malfunction. 
I was able to clear my rifle, get my jam out, reload, get back on target and hit it before the buzzer got off. I was so proud of me. I just, it was one of those, I didn't let it shake me. And it, if I come back, you know, and that's the only thing that I accomplished, it was a good match. Then I got chocolate cake too. So don't, don't get me wrong on that. Um, so that again, barricade, pretty standard. Um, and then the last stage was back at that thousand yard range. Um, and you know, day one we did, what was it? Oh, nine, nine, fifty, one thousand, eight, fifty, eight hundred. This one was four, six, uh, seven. Oh yeah, four, six, seven, five, three. Does that sound right? Maybe eight was in there. Anyway, different yardages. Your partner shot it one way. You shot it back the other way. Very simple. You just had to dial, and you had your time limit that you had to go on. Um, it was at the end of the day again. Same things affected as the stage before. The mirage, the things were just, it was the end of the day. People were tired. Um, guns were still kind of having issues. So it was, uh, it, was, it was a nice way to wrap up the end of the day, though. And we, d we did have a one fatal, <laughs> fatal. Um, yeah, the, uh, the Oblin Engineering uh, scope. scope cap died at some point. Uh, uh, I think the gun the, fell over while did. the cap was open. It did. Um, I know exactly where it happened. But that's not a big deal. I've already been in contact with the company and they have a lifetime warranty on the cap. So we're, break we're more getting the new cap in. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's not break more Let's not do stuff. that. Um, but yeah, the um, the wind was picking up too uh, when we got to mm -hmm. the, the long range stage. Uh, so there was a little bit of a wind gust mm -hmm. and on the thousand yard range, it can switch up pretty significantly. So yeah. guys would miss to either side, but um, that's the name of the game. And again, you're trying to uh, get the most shots you can in the team or in the time limit. Uh, so overall, it was a good time. And you don't think 99.9, or is it just 99? 99 seconds goes by that quick. <laughs> it really does. Um, overall, the match, you guys, we're going to go back. One, it's a great facility. Um, to the Guardian is just a it's a it's a great um, charity to support and they have a great mission and then just the atmosphere you know there's there's no gain like com, I don't want to say com, competing but nobody's gonna mess with your stuff on the line there there's gonna be constructive criticism and then there's gonna be inside jokes and and cutting up and just having a good time and probably some good food so. All in all, it was a great trip. I also got breakfast two nights for dinner, so it was great. <laughs> it, it is really, to look at a Guardian match, it is just a good group of people mm -hmm. getting together, having fun, and shooting is almost a secondary thing. I love really going to is. these because I get to meet a lot of you guys, go to them. Uh, maybe it's because I've been talking about them for this long. Uh, maybe it's just because it's a great match that attracts um, entry level and pro shooters alike. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's a ton of fun. So even if you're doing horribly, uh, even if your gun goes down, you still have a blast. Right. There were a couple of other shooters that had constant gun problems. They're still walking around with big, huge smiles on their face. They're mm -hmm. having fun. They're enjoying it. Uh, you don't see anybody kicking their rifle across the stage or <laughs> having a bad attitude or whatever. It's just, everybody is there enjoying it, uh, having a good time. So, once that wrapped up, uh, they went through and uh, they did the uh, the team scores. And I I apologize because I don't have who the top team was. I think down it was here. Clint's team, if I remember. I recognize this picture. Um, I think Clint and his teammate, which I don't know who it was. So I apologize. So again, I you'll have to go to the uh, Guardian Long Range page to check that out. And of course, we'll leave a link to the Guardian down below in the description. Um, so I don't have that info and we actually ended up cutting out as soon as we possibly could. We didn't even wait around for the, uh, late lunch, early dinner that they had prepped for us, uh, because we needed to get at least, uh, six hours of driving mm -hmm. in on uh, Sunday night so that we had the minimum amount Monday because I had to turn around <laughs> and go to work on uh, Monday afternoon. Uh, so it was a really quick turnaround. Uh, as I said, we we figured out what was wrong with my rifle. Uh, I have to go back and do some uh, homework to figure out why it was a mill off. There's still some things, some theories that I have for that. Then until I can prove them out, I'm not going to uh, give voice to them. Uh, Sarah's rifle, uh, we've got to get down, get a solid zero on it and uh, do some work with it mm -hmm. to make sure that we don't uh, have something drifting on it. Uh, but I came back. Tore the gun down completely, took it out of the chassis, wiped everything down, lubed everything up, and everything looks just fine on it. But um, 
we don't know what's going on with it yet. Well, well have I, to... I have a, I have a thought on that. I'm long story short, we changed some things. Um, I hadn't been shooting as much because it had been causing me migraines. And so we changed the length of pull. We changed a few other things on it. So I think changing that and then having him zero was kind of our first big problem. So that and it, I will take the blame 100% on the, the zero aspect of it. Because again, um, I have to zero a gun that is not anywhere even <laughs> close to my setup. The length of pull all. is very short. <laughs> Uh, so I have to be very cognizant of where I put my face on it, not to uh, eat an objective lens uh, when I'm doing the, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, ocular lens while I'm doing the zero. So it it may have been me, but uh, the gun when we when we got on the zero course and she fired three rounds on the uh, zero range that uh, Saturday, mm -hmm. um, she fired a three shot group that yeah. uh, was probably about half an inch. Uh, so it definitely, the gun is definitely shooting accurately. We just have to figure out why right. there was that drift uh, and get things squared away. And for the record, she is shooting a 308. It's this rifle we have sitting here in front of us with a uh, Ashbury Precision Ordnance Saber chassis uh, that we actually took off a Guardian prize table mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. Uh, it's a factory Remington 700 action and a 20 inch uh, 1 in 12 twist barrel. Uh, with a JP break and a U.S. Optics uh, LR17 on it. It's got an H59 reticle in it. Still running a, a Timney trigger. And the trigger's about three and a half pounds, so I'm sure she that was fairly uh, fairly amazed shooting <laughs> a, a rifle with an eight-ounce trigger on it. So, And that, a lot of people disagree with it. There's a reason for the three and a half pound trigger, because if you don't do a lot of training, uh, with moving and shooting in barricade conditions and that with it, uh, a really light trigger can be a liability. If you train with it all the time, a light trigger is just fine. Um, if you are not used to it, you kind of need to creep up to those lighter weight <laughs> triggers or they can get you in trouble. And a stage DQ really, really sucks. Uh, so that was about it overall. Again, I have one more thing to say. Okay. Uh, ladies, there were more of us there this year. If you are even considering it, if you're playing with the idea, these are the places to get started because everyone is so kind. Yes, there's a lot of testosterone-iness going on. You just got to get over it. They don't care what your hair looks like. They don't care if your shoes match. Your, they just don't. Show up and shoot. That's all they care about. So get out there and shoot with us and, and just flood this field so that they give us our own porta potty That's all I'm asking for, Okay. <laughs> There were more Porta Johns this year, though. There were, so, but none of them marked women's. I'm no, just saying. No. Help so, me out, ladies. But overall, it was a great time. It was. Um, again, if you guys want to know more about my rifle or my issues, uh, we dedicated pretty much the whole last Mail Call Mondays to it. So make sure you check that out. Uh, I want to thank Gary Larson again for inviting us down to the, the Guardian at Frontline. Uh, I want to thank Paul Smith for putting on an absolutely awesome facility or running mm -hmm. an awesome facility. And I really, really want to thank all the ROs. Mm -hmm. If I didn't thank you personally while we were down there, I apologize. But thank you very much for donating your time to yeah. this and uh, shooting the match. Now, uh, the Guardian, uh, some of the ROs apparently did compete mm -hmm. um, on uh, the previous day to be able to be included in the scores. And that's pretty standard for mm -hmm. a lot of competitions where the ROs will compete on one day and the shooters will compete on another day. Um, in a Guardian style format, uh, it's no big deal at all. Uh, and it's great that the guys get out there and they're able to run the stage. And maybe that gives them a little bit more of an idea of how to RO it effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, but thank you very much for your time. And uh, all of you guys were really great. Yes. So that's it for our after action report of mm -hmm. the Guardian Long Range match on April 7th and 8th at Frontline Defense in Warrenton, North Carolina. If you guys have any questions over anything we've covered, go ahead and leave them in the comments section below or send them to us on Facebook or Twitter. If you're listening to us on your favorite podcast app, you can email us at 8541tactical at gmail.com. If you like the video, please make sure you like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, get out and shoot. The Guardian. All right, you're going to have to get together. Otherwise, I, it's going to take me forever. I'm sorry. I don't know do what this. your problem is. You keep well, that's making... the thing is you just have to. I don't know what your problem is. Okay. okay I have to. Th I'm, I don't have lines. I'm saying this off the cup. So <clears throat> occasionally I goof it up and have to redo it. Um,